Hello, Dev, David. Great to have you. Yeah, hello, uh, Emily. Yeah, Dev. Hey, good morning, Emily. Good morning. Yeah, yeah it's been almost, uh, what, nine months since we met at OCP? Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Good to have you today. Oh, yes, thank you. I hope the topic today is much better because I, I, OCP I believe is better platform to disseminate knowledge, you know, kind of to everyone rather than keeping confidential information and everything, you know, for the broader adoption, it doesn't go well. So that's why I talk, I told uh, uh, Bahanu that I want to actually go in OCP with this paper if we can. So we will awesome. See. Yeah, that's great. Happy to have you and, you know, yes, go through it with everyone. <laughs> yes. So why is everyone joining Emily? Just a, a, a quick question for you. Uh, I know it's <laughs> we are being recorded, but just once we present what is this white paper about, what is the next step actually? Like this is completely new for me, first time I'm coming here. So what is the process wise, right? Should we send it to you and Balhanu as the lead and go from there or? Yeah, um, and then I saw that you submitted this as a document to the Global Summit. Yes. So um, this is an awesome first step, bringing it to this community first. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, we're in, Berhanu and I are in the selection process this okay. week for mm -hmm. Uh, things that will be presented at the global summit and right. so you should hear back I think the schedule is you should hear back next week as to what has been selected um, and so we'll move we'll move forward from based on that so thank you yeah good morning good evening whatever you are soprano Good morning. It's still morning for me. Thanks everyone for joining. Just bear with us. We'll give a couple minutes for more people to join. And then um, we'll go ahead and get started on the agenda. I set that out, I don't know, someday, <laughs> Monday maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, so you should have gotten it. If you did not get an email from me with the agenda, that means that you're not subscribed to the Coldplay mailing list. So if you didn't get that, then uh, go to the Cold Plate website, OCP Cold Plate website. There's a button on the side where you subscribe. And uh, there's also Berhanu and my uh, OCP contacts. So you can also reach out to us if you have questions there. Hello, Martana. 
Cheers, mate, Felix. Ah, uh, hey, dan, hello, dat is Felix. En dat dat zeker gaat door. Welcome everyone. Um, we're just giving a couple minutes for, for people to join. If you're not presenting, please mute yourself. That will be helpful for us. Thank you. Um, Anne, do you want to go ahead and get started? Again, if you're not presenting, could you please mute yourself? Hi. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, today we have a um, couple of agenda items uh, we have to go through. First, uh, we start with opens. First, if there is any any open topic anyone would like to bring in. Uh, Jesh, Jesh Wan, could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, any topics anybody wants to bring up before we uh, dive in today? Yeah, maybe we can start with a uh, couple of items. Um, one is the, for those of you who submitted um, drafts, um, I mean, the abstracts for your uh, global summit, that review process uh, started this week. So um, the timeline is to, for the review team to wrap up um, their feedback by end of the week. And and then um, I'm not sure when exactly it's gonna be communicated back to the authors. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, and then as a next step, you're gonna start um, working on your presentation slides for the Global Summit. We're waiting for the template from the foundation they are working on the graphics right now. So when the template is available, we'll go ahead and share with you. So those are a couple of opens from our end. Yeah, also something that we wanted to mention is um, there were a lot of submissions that are related to this subproject. So thank you. We really appreciate you um, submitting your abstracts. Um, like Brahane said, we're in the middle of the review process. What uh, we think would be awesome, we love that you all want to present at the Global Summit. It would also be great to bring these topics into the Cold Plate subproject. Um, so, you know, we're always looking for agenda items for things that um, we can discuss as a community and collaborate on as a community. And um, we'd love for you to bring that information into this group so that we can have a conversation, um, you know, as opposed to only presenting it at the Global Summit, right? So um, those sorts of things that you've submitted for the Global Summit are great items to bring into this forum. So, um, if you've done that, uh, just contact us and we can uh, bring those topics in. Yeah, that's that's a good point. If, um, especially bringing that at early stage, the advantage is, um, um, I, I think this is more on you know first time contributors. Uh, when you are bringing a topic, um, sometimes it's, it, it, it's better to get feedback from the community and also uh, any of the content uh, in your in your draft, uh, if there is any misalignment with the OCP initiative with driving, uh, that's where you get feedback from the community as well as from the leads, uh, and then you go back and uh, make those changes on your draft. That way, highly likely those um, content go through through the review process. So it, it's it's advantage uh, coming to the community and sharing. So maybe going forward, um, we prefer not to see those contributions as a surprise, uh, but it, it, it's, it still goes through the process. But yeah, we, we highly recommend bringing to the to this meeting. We were just excited to see so many topics that yeah. <laughs> people apparently don't want to talk about on our meeting. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, 
if there's no other opens, then today uh, Dev has joined us from Intel and he's going to go over a pumped two phase DLC solution. So, Dev, uh, ready when you are. Uh, okay, uh, good morning all. Can you see my screen uh, with the presentation? Okay, all yes. right. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for giving this opportunity in a uh, quick time. Uh, so Emily and Bahan really appreciate. Uh, we, uh, Intel, along with uh, uh, industry partners, Verti, Honeywell, Park, uh, Associates, we have been working uh, on two phase uh, I would like to actually spell out a little bit on the refrigerant-based DLC because there are uh, several uh, two-phase cooling technologies so available. Diana, yeah. yes, um, could you please mute yourself? Again, if you're not presenting, could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Sorry, Deb. No, please. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, this is a two-phase DLC system, and this uh, particular technology uh, that we are trying to actually bring or introduce to the market is actually it's a refrigerant-based. Uh, it could be low-pressure refrigerant or it could be medium-pressure refrigerant, and I will talk a little bit more about it. But uh, last year, Intel in the supercomputing conference, Intel has announced two-phase solution for their uh, um, for our uh, what, uh, accelerators, Gaudi T. So there has been a lot of questions actually coming from different open forums. It's like, what is this new technology? How it differs from the other technologies in the market and other things. So uh, along with our partners here, uh, actually, even though I'm a presenter here, actually, I would like to mention uh, all the quarters here, the Stip Turn from Verti, Nitin, Kalwa from Honeywell, Elvis and Joe from Parker Hannifin, uh, from the Q, uh, Elvis is from the QD side of uh, Spogon division, Joe is from the host division, and also Quing Yang uh, from the Associates for representing the low pressure side of the pudding technology. So what we are trying to bring up in this particular white paper is trying to introduce what these technologies, why it is needed. So it's a basic uh, fundamental paper we are trying to uh, bring to everybody's attention. And we are using the OCP platform as it's actually accessible to anyone in the world. Uh, um, uh, and they can actually understand what is the differentiation of this particular technology versus other uh, DLC-based technologies in the world. And at the same time, what is the maturity or the scale up if somebody wants to actually think about that way? Uh, to start with, we understand this is not the same uh, at the scale as a single phase uh, water or the uh, PG-25 based cooling solution. But our intention is to present this paper and let uh, the audience or technologists know about this technology. Uh, with that, this well, white paper is uh, actually written in such a way that there is no confidential information uh, from any of the companies of the uh, authors here. So this is very uh, generic one. It's not a new technology, if you will, in the power electronics or aerospace industry. This may be the new technology for the, the uh, cooling technologist on the IT or the server design side. Um, traditionally, folks are used for air cooling, water, uh, water PG-25, single phase liquid cooling based DLCs. So, uh, and another uh, solution on the two phase side is, uh, I think, uh, in the market is uh, Zutaco solution. So, this is a little bit of a different type of two phase cooling technology we want to actually showcase. Um, this uh, information may be useful for the silicon designers like ourselves. Like, we can take advantage of this uh, cooling uh, technology uh, to get the better heat transfer uh, thermal performance. We can, uh, so basically they can increase the performance either via TDP, lower TJs, uh, oops, my bad, uh, lower TJs and uh, other uh, uh, system level advantages and uh, PUEs and sustainability part of it, et cetera. 
Also, uh, data center facility folks, installation and operational perspective, this uh, paper will be very nice for, for them to understand what this technology is, how, what are the challenges they need to actually foresee, uh, how this technology is in compliance with their current HVAC technology. It's not a new technology, just the add-on technology, but the application is instead of facility side, it's on the IT side. So what are the differences they need to actually understand? Uh, it may be helpful for the cooling solution providers, the current uh, liquid cooling solution providers. Okay, what is the new technology in the market? There is uh, just for the side note, actually, we have also submitted one uh, two page paper for the future. Uh, 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 I'm forgetting the name, the future technologies for them for the OCP, uh, where we are trying to actually see if we can have even the universal code plate between single phase and low pressure refrigerant and medium pressure refrigerant, uh, we will be submitting the demo, actually live demonstration unit for different liquids and showing the thermal performance. So there is a potential to have quite a bit of standardization and commonality uh, to actually use one solution, uh, one server side of the solution. Again, it's a vision, it's not yet there, but maybe use a OCP platform to get it there. Uh, use the same uh, server design and maybe use uh, the cooling technology, uh, which of the cooling technology you want to use, whether it's a single phase, two phase, low pressure, medium pressure, refrigerant, et cetera. Uh, again, uh, this particular technology brings the sustainability KPIs like the lower PV TCO because you can actually bring quite uh, warmer refrigerants uh, to cool kilowatt plus of accelerators that can actually eliminate or reduce the need of your chillers, which is the basically the energy hog uh, bring the PV down. So, uh, for the for the Folks who cares about sustainability, this may uh, be a good technology to look into. Um, also for the ecosystem partners, as well as the academic researchers, they will understand where, where, the, uh, where the industry is moving. Some of the government entities uh, uh, who is trying to actually uh, push some regulations based on PUE and other, other things like you have seen Alpha uh, cooler chips program going on. Uh, venture capitalist investor, they always look for this information. Uh, a lot of folks actually ping me personally to understand uh, where this technology is going. So I think it's a, a good uh, uh, paper we want. Uh, we are uh, we have written already. It's ready to be shared or sent for the review, etc. So those are the folks we are looking at. Um, for Time being, I'm just going a little bit speed. So this particular technology is the, as we said, it's a DLC based, direct liquid cooling port plate based solution. Uh, uh, the technology uses low GWP, HFO based, non-flammable, vaporizable, uh, dielectric fluids or called refrigerants. Uh, the the refrigerants word is basically uh, at room pressure. Uh, these boiling points are way below the atmospheric, so I will call it, that's the differentiation quickly. Uh, it, this uses the pump system because whenever people, uh, we hear the refrigerants, automatically everybody thinks about the compressor. And then they say, they everyone will say, hey, this is a very, uh, what do you call, uh, co coefficient of performance is very low and uh, not energy uh, sufficient, so efficient solution. Uh, so I want to stress out that this is a pump based solution. So pump uh, takes uh, quite a low power than the compressor. The heat is extracted from the cold plates uh, to cool your processors uh, using the heat of vaporization. So uh, uh, boiling, so you will, uh, it uses the boiling mechanism, which gives you the best thermal performance. And it's also the convective boiling. So that uh, it, according to the heat transfer, you. It, uh, Correlations, you wish, you should get the best thermal performance of uh, any cooling technologies having the boiling and the forced convection at the same time. The exit quality is always kind of rules of thumb is maintained at 75 uh, uh, percent, which is the 75 percent vapor going out. So it will always have the vapor uh, liquid mixture and the heat ejection at the CDU side. It could be air, it could be uh, facility water. So that is also done by the condensation. So from Basically, from the look perspective, you will get two phase uh, 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 phenomenon for the heat uh, extraction and uh, uh, transfer to the ambient. This will give you the best thermal performance in the, the cooling solution. So that's a high level uh, working principle. 
if you look at now why it is critical, like uh, you uh, may have seen a couple of demos in the Alpha E Summit uh, uh, by our NVIDIA partners also. So, so as you saw, the, the GPU or the accelerator TDP is going quite higher. Uh, it would reach to two kilowatt in a couple of years. So uh, on the on the other side, the heat flux on the or we call the hotspots on the SOCs are, are also going very high, much higher than the standard uh, CPU side of the world. There is a lot of heterogeneous integration happening with the different eyes are top on each other. So the the thermal resistance at the package is higher. There are multi chips, HBMs, etc. Right. So the cooling challenges are. Sean Faulty, can you please mute yourself? You're not muted. Thank you. Go ahead, Dev. Yes, uh, the server density is going higher. Uh, rack powers are going higher. Again, I'm just trying. Everything is yeah, aware. People are aware of these thermal challenges, and at the same time, actually. Uh, what is the critical for the OCP will be the sustainability part of it because these particular solutions offer warm water cooling uh, for actually cooling these kind of processors. Uh, we have shown that even with the 55 UC uh, saturation temperature of these refrigerants, we can cool several kilowatts of accelerators as of now. So that allows the data center folks to operate, uh, you know, uh, the the facilities at much better PUE. They can uh, reuse the heat because rule of thumb is you need exo exit temperature greater than 50 C to reuse that. So that those are the things can be managed using this technology. So so that is why we are actually saying the, the what is the importance of this technology compared to the current one. It's it's you know there is always pros and cons, but these are the uh, major advantages. So in this white paper, actually, this is the table of content. As I mentioned, the paper is already written, and you can see it's almost 34 pages paper. So we kind of shorten it a lot. <laughs> it's like uh, we don't want it to write a book, but just uh, introductory part of it. So this is our first paper uh, trying to explain what is these technologies. And uh, you can see that like uh, the code page design, CDU side of the world, like what kind of CDUs are available, flow distribution network, like like low manifold or interact manifold, how, how it is done, what are the filtration sites, how is the reliability, like we haven't actually described or spelled out each and everything, but kind of high level, uh, we actually trying to showcase uh, the maturity of this cooling technology at, uh, I would say, 30 pages limit at this point. Uh, and then uh, basically what we are requesting is uh, to this OCP committee is allow this white paper to be published in the, again, OCP summit. I understood that like, uh, committee is reviewing the papers. This way it will be introduced as a new DLC cooling technology available in the market and it has some future uh, prospects uh, for it, for uh, depending on the applications. Also, uh, being a uh, very new technology in the market, it's in, I would say it's in infancy stage, like we have uh, in, a few end-to-end -end solutions available, but before, just like the, in the single phase uh, liquid cooling, before it goes too broad with different server design, different components, this may be the chance for OCP to standardize some of the components or the interfaces uh, to actually use different servers by different companies or different uh, uh, OXMs uh, to use this technology much broader or much quicker uh, uh, than the, the single phase liquid cooling in general. Um, so that, that's what we are actually coming here uh, to present this uh, white paper and uh, just uh, let me share one more quickly. As I mentioned, this particular white paper is already uh, ready. Uh, this is just the, the glimpse uh, of that white paper. It's, and if there's any, any other templates or anything, we are, uh, you know, we can always uh, change those templates, but it's ready for the review uh, by the committee. So, so Emily and Barhanu, I think that's, that's what I wanted to share in. <laughs> 15, 20 minutes that any questions that I can answer. Yeah, this 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 is awesome. Thank you for coming and sharing Dev. Um yeah, um I don't remember uh, any other uh, I mean similar kind of technology other than Zura core 
being shared within the community. Um, but yeah, so new new technologies like this, it's really uh, we we encourage other contributors also to come in and share and um, get feedback from the team. So yeah, really appreciate it. Please go ahead and um, ask any question. I think we have some minutes here. Yeah, thanks, Steph. Appreciate it. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? So uh, I have one question that um, I understand this is like very basic paper, I guess you're trying to publish on Two-Face, but is there any detailed discussion we'll go and do it, uh, do on this topic in this like OCP call? Uh, so that is, so this is, I will say the opening statement of new technology. I will say it's like a parallel technology to the single phase DLC solution. So. Uh, Emily and Balhan, we can talk about like, do we need a parallel track? Because just like, uh, you know, material compatibility, reliability, design of QDs, hoses, like each and every ingredient could be in parallel. Right. And how many, how much standardization we need to go in. So at a, I don't know, at a higher level, we can discuss this uh, and who wants to be part of this coalition or this particular work groups, etc. So we can go from, from there. So I, I just wanted for this time, we just wanted to actually bring it up to the common platform uh, uh, using this paper and go from there, how, how we want to actually make it standardization, etc. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think as a next step, you put it out there, um, what what's going to follow. So this is yeah, probably like an intro to a new technology to the, for this compute community. Um, as a next step, maybe um, there might be more contributors to join the effort. Uh, standardization might be one, um, even collaborating to take this to the next level. Um, so it could maybe... be standardization or just think about the corporate design could be just the paper in itself. You know, what are the, what are the differences yeah. folks need to be worried about compared to single phase, two phase? How can we have the commonality between the two code pairs? Those are the, you know, think about each and every component and you can actually get more details. And those could be the, the staggered on papers that we can actually publish in, uh, uh, you know, uh, normal cadence. Think about like every one of, you know, quarter. And there are a lot of revisions we can do as more details coming from different vendors. Yeah, so certainly if there's interest, we can, um, you know, for example, create a work stream and, and build a team and people can collaborate on this. Um, this was a very high level overview of this. And so I, I wonder if people are interested in seeing like more of the details, like what's more included in the, I'm not, I haven't seen the white paper, so I don't know how in depth the white paper goes. But I wonder if there's interest, you know, to Pardeep's question of uh, maybe going a little bit deeper than than just this introductory um, presentation. Um, Pardeep, would that answer the question that you had if there was a session where we went deeper into the details of this? Yeah, that helps. And uh, yeah, what Dave said, right, I agree that we need to make our different work streams and uh, that will be helpful. I guess there is an interest in the industry, but um, like we have to start from somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the other the other thing, Dev, that I just wanted to mention is um, if you could send this over to Burhanu and myself, this this white paper, um, and then we will have to review it. And then there's a cold plate requirements document. So I don't know if you all reviewed that document uh, while you were building this white paper, but um, that might help as well. Like what is in there um, and make sure that this is aligned with that. Yes, Emily. Uh, short answer is yes. The the requirements from the single. So so I have actually a small paper that we are actually talking. If you want to go to the two phase code pad solution, what are the extra requirements that you may have to bring it? It's like only few a uh, couple of them at least that we see right now. Uh, that we may actually add up on to the single phase 
code plate requirement and it becomes now overarching in general the code plate requirements either for single phase and two phase so again that's a that could be the the small couple of pages you know paper or just the extension of that requirements etc we can think about okay mm -hmm. yeah i just know that document has things about single phase and two phase so um it's not only based on single phase. Okay. And then um, the other thing is I just want to promote uh, Philip's work stream. We have also a coolant fluids work stream where uh, they meet uh, biweekly to talk about uh, the coolant. And so part of that is also um, developing a, a, a white paper for two phase coolants. So okay. uh, it would love to have your, you know, participation or your team's participation in that effort as well. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I will work with Bahano to get into those meetings as well. Yes. Thank you. Hey, Dave, this is Philip. I have a question about your liquid cooling loop design. Your cold plate, is it a traditional microchannel design or you have specific design for this uh, so this, this is a very traditional code per design. Uh, uh, technically speaking, uh, we will actually showcase in you know, one of the demo in the village. Uh, Emily, that's another present. Uh, you know, we have topic submitted. We will actually demonstrate uh, the code pit is exactly the same between the single phase and two phase. It's a traditional uh, code pit that we are actually bringing for two phase. It's nothing new uh, than single phase. By the way, when you want to actually get more and better and better performance, you can always uh, go for customization on it using different types of weeks and other things called two-phase. But what we are trying to showcase is uh, having the same code pit between single and two-phase is good enough for two-phase uh, performance-wise at this point. Thanks. And uh, your schematic design, you only use a copper pipe? Do you use a flexible tubing as well? Yes, we use the flexible tubing, and that's why uh, we just, uh, just to answer that question, in this paper, we will talk about the hoses, the permeation rates, a lot of that information is included in this paper, and we use flexible hoses, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this that's all I have, Emily. Thank you. Okay, so we have another topic uh, today as well. Um, Pardeep and is going to talk about an erosion study for fluid velocity limits. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yes. So, so we want to talk about. I'll go through uh, initial few sli few slides, and uh, then I give it to Lochan for the in detail uh, explanation of what we are doing. So, uh, so we are working on erosion study for single phase. As you know, like um, our rag densities are increasing tremendously, and uh, so we need a higher flow rates and um, maybe more efficient cold plates uh, to if we stay with the single phase cold, cold plate cooling, right? So we already like uh, cooling down around uh, 150, like 150 kilowatt we reach per rack. And um, so future projection are much higher. So for that, we started looking into erosion study that uh, because in the literature, it is given uh, mostly 1.5 meter per second for the copper uh, surfaces, right? So uh, in this study, when we, um, so when we started, we looked at at which locations, like uh, you get a highest uh, velocities, you achieve a highest velocity. So we, we got it in, uh, uh, we saw that it will be at a bar because uh, that's an area that get uh, constricted, right? And uh, so uh, where the velocity can go much higher. So it can be like where this uh, coolant entering the cold plate and then uh, when it is heating the surface at the bottom of the cold plate. 
and uh, inside the cold plate usually like velocities are very low because uh, the coolant get di distributed into um, uh, multiple channels uh, fin channels and uh, so velocities drop uh, drastically and it is mostly a laminar re region um uh, so um, we we develop a experimental setup so we started with a, a small experimental setup where we have like uh, one cool plate uh, and uh, uh, we use uh, pressure sensors across the cool plate and the temperature sensor and measure the thermal resistance of it and uh, we make sure that in this entire setup we have uh, uh, we have the everything uh, made up of stainless steel except the cold plate um and uh, so uh, so we and uh, another thing what we did like we test this setup uh, run this setup for 150 uh, five five months uh, to in total and uh, our uh, how we are tr trying to uh, look into copper content is like we are taking a sample every month and uh, sending it to uh, labs for testing to see if there is any copper content uh, increase and second thing we looked into in this is that uh, we used a cold plate uh, you can't open that cold plate but what we did we used two cold plate at the same time like one is completely manufactured new cold plate and uh, without using it and then we use uh, after like uh, running the test for the five month uh, we we cut that cold plate and uh, then we took the all the images and compare both the cold plate images right with uh, like without the without using it and with uh, like five months of testing so for this like uh, we give the flow rate like to single cold plate up to 7.7 .7 LPM, uh, which was like 2.3 GPM. And velocities we achieve at the bar or uh, inlet of the cold, uh, cold plate is 2.62 uh, meter per second, which is much higher than 1.5 meter per second uh, uh, um, uh, in, a, in a literature uh, with and we haven't able to found, uh, find any like empirical data right to support that claim. And similarly, like in uh, APDM hose that we use for this setup there, the velocity was 1.74 meter per second. And um, uh, the heat load we gave to the uh, thermal test vehicle is around 490 watts. And um, as I was explaining, we were taking a sample of every like uh, 30 days. Um, and we looked into all the parameters like pH, conductivity, and uh, copper content, uh, uh, if it is increasing with time or not. And I uh, we kept supply temperature of the coolant around 45 degrees C. So this is like what we did. And um, recently we we have done the more dig into literature and uh, we are uh, uh, coming up with uh, some of the, um, based on that data, we are coming up with uh, some of the new experiment that uh, Lochan will explain. Uh, so from here, I'll hand it over to Lochan uh, to explain it uh, about the experiments. Lochan? Do you want to share a screen or should I go ahead? Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Oh, Pratip, there's a problem with my uh, access. Can you please share this, the, the PPT back? Yeah. Can you see? Uh, yes, uh, we can see this. Uh, let me start. Uh, so for this experiment, we were observing uh, on the cold plate side, we were observing uh, three main parameters. The first one was thermal resistance of the cold plate. Uh, the second one is the pressure drop. And the third one is the, uh, the flow rate of the cold, uh, across the cold plate. Uh, for the 150 days of operation, uh, the, initially we were, we were looking into how much the variation of the thermal resistance was observed from day one to day 150. And the initial uh, day of testing, we were able to see like uh, 0. 0.0. 0.23 uh, degree C by watt of thermal resistance. And 
uh, yes, here you can see two different pump configurations in the graph. Uh, uh, this is due to like uh, initially uh, at 48 days of testing, there were two pumps connected in parallel, which was able to give a combined flow rate of 7.8 to 7.9 LPM on average. But after 48 days of testing, uh, the liquid started leaking from the impeller. So we had to uh, replace the pump with a new one. After the uh, second pump was introduced, a uh, new, uh, new pump was introduced, the flow rate dropped down to uh, 7.6 to 7.7 .7 LPM, which we were able to see a few difference in the thermal resistance at that particular point. But overall from day uh, zero to day 150, the overall thermal resistance is almost the same. And uh, from this uh, thermal resistance parameter point of view, uh, we see that there is no much uh, effect of flow rates or higher flow rates in the cold plate for over a long period of time. And we can even continue uh, working for the same uh, high flow rates uh, on the cold plate for even longer period of time without having uh, any damage in the cold plate. Uh, coming to the pressure drop, uh, uh, Pratim, next slide, please. Uh, looking at the pressure drop across the cold, uh, across the cold plate, initially for the pump one configuration for the initial one of 48 days of testing, uh, the average pressure drop per day was measured around 224 kPa. At the end of testing, it was 225.6. It was like almost 1.6 kPa of difference. After the pumps were changed, uh, the pressure drop dropped down to 214 kPa. Uh, it was due to the uh, in, in, uh, introduction of new pump and the flow rate was around like 7.6 to 7.7 .7 LPM due to that which we were seeing a drop in pressure at uh, you know, between the pump 1 and pump 2 configuration. At the end of testing uh, at the 158 day, the average pressure drop across the cold plate was measured around 213.84 kPa which is nearly equal to 214 if we consider all the uncertainties and the accuracy measurements of the pressure sensors. So that all become like, uh, from this, we can conclude that, uh, uh, like there is, uh, uh, pressure drop usually changes if there is any change in internal, uh, dime, uh internal surface areas of there is any, uh, damaging of the co uh, microfilm channel surface areas from this, we can see that there, the pressure drop almost was constant throughout the whole testing period. That was, there was almost no change in, uh, the inter internal surfaces throughout the whole testing, uh, period. Uh, looking into the flow rates, oh, Pradeep, next slide, please. Uh, the flow rate initially, which we were observed, uh, which we observed in the pump one configuration, was around seven point eight nine LPM. At the end, it was of uh, forty eight days of testing, it came to seven point eight six. Uh, at after the pumps uh, were swapped with a new one, uh, the, the we were able to achieve a maximum flow rate of seven point six uh seven point six LPM. At the end of testing, it dropped to seven point six uh seven point six files or uh, like a point one lpm of pressure uh of change in flow rate uh this is mostly because of uh, the pumps uh performance decrease over the period but due to the cold plate uh point of view there is no change in the cold plate and the cold plate was good to even operate at higher flow rates or even for a longer period of time uh coming to the coolant analysis uh, uh well, we were sampling coolant for every 30 days of uh, 30 day period and we were looking into different parameters uh, different uh, parameters like pH, conductivity, uh, turbidity of the liquid, copper content in the liquid, and also the uh, corrosion inhibitor, the toilet-iazole levels. Uh, for this current liquid uh, coolant, which we were using uh, was a PG25. And at the initial uh, uh, day zero, uh, when the, point, uh, the coolant was sampled, we were able to see a, a copper content in the liquid as 0. 0.5. Uh, 141 ppm or we can also say it as 141 uh, parts per billion uh, after a few days of testing we see a, a quite uh, a rise in the co copper content level for the next 30 and 60 days period after that it again drops back to uh, 234 and it rises between the range of 240 parts per billion for the next uh, uh, 60 uh, next 90 days of testing uh, the overall observation was that uh, the copper content never increased above 1 uh, 1 ppm uh, in the whole, whole uh, coolant, uh, it states that there was uh, almost uh, no uh, uh, loss of copper throughout the in the in the cold plate. Uh, right now, in the uh, as Pradeep mentioned earlier, like in the loop, we were only using copper. Uh, the, the main source for copper was the cold plate uh, itself. The all the other parts which we were using in the the fittings, the reservoir or the heat exchanger, they were all made from stainless steel, uh, which eliminates the copper from other. Uh, uh, this will this will say like. 
from this we can see that the copper will be the, uh, the main source of copper increasing in the variation in the uh, in the coolant would be from the coal plate itself so overall for the 150 days of testing the cop the copper content level was below 1 power, 1 ppm and the P, uh, looking into the ph of the uh, we see a quite decline in the ph uh, the liquid was turning quite acid a uh, little acidic from 8.5 to 8.2 it is still in the safe limits of operations uh, set by the uh, fluid vendors but uh, there is a, uh, this, uh, this is one of the observe, observe, uh, this is one of the parameters we observed that there was a little decrease of ph value over the period of time before you go to the next slide just a couple questions um you said that the copper content stayed below one parts per million. Mm -hmm. Is that the the level of goodness? Like, is that the requirement that it stay below that, or is uh, that just usually like uh, for uh, the fluid vendor recommendation for the uh, copper content is like around uh, three to four ppm uh, in the liquid. And uh, since we are uh, usually that's for a regular data center scenarios where the co flow rates are much lower than what we are performing in this uh, state. Usually in a data center, uh, coal plates might uh, go up to like one LPM or two, uh, 1.5 LPM maximum. But here in our case, we are going around 7.8 LPM, which is uh, uh, way higher than the current standard, which is followed in the data center. So for this level, we were expecting the copper content to be even more higher than uh, two to three PPM uh, than the recommended. But uh, overall, we observed that uh, the whole, uh, the the copper concentra concentration in the coolant was below 1 ppm for the 150 days of testing at high flow rates. Yeah, and to be clear, you're, the the ash rate guideline is 1.5 meters per second. So, and you just said you were at seven, but seven is liters per minute. So you're, we're mixing yeah. units there. So it's yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> so we okay. are at 2.6, I guess, uh, meter per second. 2.6 so, meters per yeah. second. Okay. The coal plate, we looked into different cross sections in the coal plate and uh, at, uh, except from the fin, ch fin channel area, the micro fin channel area, the other areas where uh, the other cross section areas where the coolant will be flowing through uh, every on at all the points it had like around 2.69 to 2.62. It's approximately 2.62 meters per second. Okay. Um. And did you all run a control test? So uh, you're running this loop at a higher velocity than what you than what the recommendation is, the 1.5 meters per second. Did you run the same test in the same period of time on a separate loop with with the velocity at 1.5 meters per second, so that you could compare these two? Uh, so actually, our point uh, for this test was to see like if we go above the current set uh, set limit of 1.5 meters per second, will we be seeing any uh, erosion in that? Uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, we, our current assumption was 1.5 meters per second was set based on some uh, data, which uh, Ashley might have gone through. But uh, so we wanted to cross verify that if we go above 1.5 meters per second, will we be able to really see uh, any uh, change in copper content or will there be any damage, change in surface topography of copper or any damages uh, damaging in the cop coal plate? That was our main uh, 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 objective for the study. So Emily, it, it's it's more like if we are safe at a higher limit, then we are definitely safe at 1.5, right? That was the objective. But um, yeah. I'll show you in a later slide, like what we are going to do next, because we gather a lot of data from our other vendors also now. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's more like, um, like this pH curve, for example. Would right. that happen at 1.5 meters per second as well? And can you can, you know, compare that? And then this copper content curve where it goes up and then comes back down, would that also happen? But maybe it's at a lower level mm -hmm. if you were running it at 1.5. I'm just asking if you ran it. It sounds like no. No. So. Yeah. So uh, I can jump in. Um. So Sean. Uh, so the plan was is to repeat at uh, 1.5 meters per second and then at an even um, higher fluid velocity for a comparison to to see if we do see those trends. So, and I think they are planning to show that in the, the later slides only. Well, I hope. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Yeah, Rahana, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I think, Sean, yeah. Um, 
that I know few folks are here or part of the Asher guideline who involved. So um, that that's the guideline. So pretty much for what you said, Emily, having that baseline is critical to compare with um, because depending on how these um, Coldplay uh, geometry, the fins, and all that detail is designed, um, th these numbers might be different. So having that um, baseline um, for velocity 1.5 or below, th that, that would be ideal to compare with. So I just want to mention that. Um, uh, this one has a question. Yeah, it's like both like a comment and a question. I think a uh, few folks are here in the recent Ashra conference and, you know, this topic has been discussed to be, on, to be honest. And uh, there were so many things out there that said 1.5, some said eight feet per second. Like there are so many articles out there where there was no set one, set thing. And I think Pradeep mentioned that. But uh, one big thing for me was a few articles I was reading, they were talking about the temperature and uh, like more than 140F uh, or something like that, the erosion limit is lower. So what temperature did we run this at? So that is my first question. And the second question is, I'm slightly confused on why the copper content decreased over time. Uh, did I miss something? Like, did you guys change something? Or uh, is it a closed loop? Yeah, at what point did you change the pump? You changed uh -huh. the pump at some point. Was that yes. at the 60 day mark? Uh, it was between 30 day and 40, 60 day. It was at 40th day. Uh, uh, to answer Jashwan's question, the temperature uh, inlet uh, for the cold plate was at 45 degrees C. Uh, yeah. It was uh, usual recommendation is around thir uh, 25 to 35, but we kept the loop running at 45 degrees C, which would be the maximum for a data center scenario based on the guidelines. Like uh, the, the maximum limit which we keep inlet at the for the any loops. So forty five was our uh, current uh, uh, inlet uh, inlet for the coolant, and uh, the copper content here like uh, uh, maybe uh, what we are currently assuming is that that uh, the drop drop could be maybe due to the uh, inhibitors present in that maybe the inhibitor started acting after some particular point of time. Uh, we also look. Uh, we are not sure how what other inhibitors were. Uh, the vendor did, never disclosed us the different corrosion inhibitors except for the tolutrizol levels in that. So we are only aware of the uh, parameter, uh, the uh, the levels of uh, tolutrizol over the period of one fifty days. But uh, we are not sure how the different corrosion inhibitors in the liquid were acting over a period of time during this test. And and, and the, what is the liquid name? Uh, PG twenty five. It's proprietary. Oh, it, I think it's proprietary, so we don't want to compare fluids, Emily. So try and protect that fluid vendor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and the thing is that to answer just one question that uh like exactly there. So our motive is to drive both OCP and ASHRAE uh to look into this limit. So that's why we are working with through Ali Hadari in uh ASHRAE as well uh, uh for these erosion limits. Um, Michael Coffin, did that answer your question about the anti-corrosion in the PG twenty five? It sounds it sounds like it yeah, was. Yeah, did. Yeah, I just responded in the chat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks John. Um, and then Philip has a question also. Yeah. Um, uh, this copper content is a quite big jump, and the pH shift is pretty large too. Is it common to have that much pH depression? For PG twenty five liquid running in closed loop, it can fill. Um, I think Dave is on the call too. We th this isn't atypical of what you'll see in a closed liquid cooled loop with cold plate, copper cold plates. Um, so I, there's kind of like the point three point two ppm. That's kind of what we would see uh, typically. Sometimes it's a little lower in the point one point two range. Um, yeah, because when you drop pH. It become more corrosive for copper, even you have azo in the PG. Yeah, yeah, but I the thing the thing to remember is the initial timeline. Uh, I don't know if David's on. David might want to jump in, but um, it will. It usually will level out around um, eight point two at some point. Um, 
but I agree. Yeah, it, it, there is the initial drop off. Uh, David, you want to comment? Too? For that, uh, go ahead. If I may. Uh, so, uh, Philip, when uh, we have a reservoir in the loop, which is uh, in initially at day zero, it is completely filled with uh, glycol. For every 30 days, whenever we are sampling like uh, uh, 750 ml, 1000 ml or from the reservoir, that particular volume of liquid is being replaced by air. And even though it is closed, uh, uh, it would be like constantly oxid uh, whatever air is inside present in the reservoir right now after 30 days. Again, it would be increased after 60 days when we are collecting an additional one liter sample to send for analysis. So whenever this uh, amount of air inside the reservoir is being increased, there is a possibility that the uh, coolant will be reacting with that air, maybe to oxidize or to uh, to form to uh, can uh, lead to lower pH. Because, but in a data center, when we are looking into data center level, uh, we whenever we remove some liquid for sampling, we all the, there will be fill pumps which always fill the loops back with fresh PG twenty five time to time to uh, to replenish the uh, amount which is being drawn out for sample. There, uh, there will be again addition of new corrosion inhibitors, and it would be making the pH line stable over a period of time. But here, the amount of sample which we are drawing out, it is come uh, now replaced with air uh, atmospheric air. So that could be one possible reason for the reduce of pH over a period of time. Okay, thanks. Any other questions while we're paused on this? Yeah, I have one. Um, can you guys share uh, the uh, type of EPDM hose you used to connect to the cold plate and also the pressure sensor that you have employed? Like what company and what is the part number? I don't, know if we could do, I don't think we could do company and part number, but this is self cured EPDM, right? Uh, okay. uh, a peroxide cured EPDM. Oh, it's peroxide. All right, yeah. Peroxide cured EPDM. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, here is the analysis done just specifically for copper, but yeah, it would be great if we have data for those um, as well, but higher flow rates. Also to the question earlier about the uh, higher temperature, so 45 degrees C inlet, um, Jaswant was saying 100, is it 113 Fahrenheit? And Jaswant was saying 140 Fahrenheit. Do you know, um, I mean, you have the power numbers and you have the flow rate. So, but do you know what the outlet temperature was? Outlet temperature was around 46.7 to 47 degrees C, uh, which I uh, recorded. The base temperature throughout the testing period was around 57. Uh, initially, it was 57.6. At the end of 150 days, it was 57.9 degrees C. Okay. Three degrees okay. C. And on average, it was a 0.3 degrees C. Rise. <laughs> It sounds like maybe there would be some value in running at higher temperatures as well. Yeah, yeah, that's the next stage. Um, but I think we just want to try and evaluate the fluid velocity. It takes a while for this, as you can see. So what I think the next step was fluid velocity, um, do the control, and then um, we, we were thinking about accelerating to see if we could um, get some sort of sense of how, how much acceleration we could we could have of any failure modes. I think we're running out of time, Lotion. Do you want to skip to the last slide on the future work, maybe, and then we can sure. wrap up? So, the last that is. Uh, so, currently, from the uh, Ashley 2011 Ashley handbook of HVAC uh, applications. Uh, for the flexible tubing, it was given as 1.5 meters per second uh, in a uh, scenario where the operation of uh, data center loops is more than 8,000 hours per year. So this was the velocity limit, which we found from 1.5 meters per second. And uh, so initially that was our, our main point of uh, reference. And uh, looking into some other guidelines uh, from ASHRAE, it was from TC9.0 liquid cooling guidelines, third edition, uh, it was mentioned like uh, we can go like around three meters per second in that uh, and uh, from the from a different uh, uh, Parker uh, is a 
manufacturing of uh, uh, guys from hose and they said like uh, we can go like up to 6.1 meters per second in a hose and uh, that uh, like for a pressurized uh, uh, pipelines we can go like on a 6.1 meters per second and uh, that would be the maximum velocity limit to see uh, the 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 the, the, cool, the epdm hoses are safe from uh, eroding so based on this uh, current guidelines we are looking into three different studies again where uh, first one will be the epdm uh, uh, erosion where will be of uh, going more than four to five meters per second uh, currently our uh, goal is to go to our 6.5 meters per second to see if uh, we can see any uh, erosion over uh, of the uh, epdm uh, uh, epdm internal surfaces for that high flow rates at high temperatures and we'll be looking into the epdm top surface topography and we'll be also look looking into the coolant analysis to see if we can find any uh, 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 eroded particles of the surface Along with that, uh, we are looking into copper erosion as well, where uh, the first one would be impinging erosion. If what would be the uh, what would happen to a copper surface when the cool uh, when the coolant is directly impinging on the surface at a, uh, at ninety degree angle, and uh, for a flow rates higher than three meters per second, and we will be looking into the copper surface topography and also at coolant analysis to see the uh, copper content and other parameters variate uh, vary from uh, period to period. Uh, and the third case would be the shearing uh, erosion where the coolant will be flown parallelly on the uh, copper surface like you see in this uh, schematic and the coolant flow rates we are uh, right now considering to go over three meters per second uh, it would mostly depend upon how the pumps uh, what would the maximum capacity of the pumps so that is our current uh, work uh, so from this uh, we would uh, like from this study we would like to uh, uh, we would like to present to the OCP white paper and also collaborate with Ashtray to have uh, this limits of erosion, which can be helpful for uh, the data centers uh, worldwide to see what could be the maximum flow rates and what is the limits and how we can uh, define them based on experimental data. Yeah, uh, that's all from our side. Uh, is there any questions on? Hi, yes, this is Steve Keith from Celestica. Actually, I typed my question into the uh, the comment section. Um, tying this presentation uh, to the previous one on pump two phase, where you use refrigerant as a uh, working fluid, is this erosion uh, concern only with the water-based systems, or do we need to be concerned about it in refrigerant-based systems, or is it, is it immune to this phenomenon? Uh, I can say that one. I think it would apply to two phase as well. Um, I don't think in Asher we we define it by uh, cooling technology. It's just the idea of the fluid interacting with the piping. So um, obviously one type of mechanism would be with water and there may be an erosion corrosion mechanism, but you would still have erosion even with the refrigerant. And But the only thing is that in two phase, uh, what Sean is correct is correct, uh, completely correct that um, it will happen with the two phase. But the thing is that in two phase, you get, uh, you have very low velocities. So maybe that's helpful, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. And, and can we, I mean, should we just say this for only for the cold plate or should we say for any copper tube that is in the data center loop? Really, it should extend to anything in the copper loop, in the loop. But uh, that is another clarification. I'm trying to work with um, Ashray, Mark Stinky, and Ali and Orion uh, to clarify because the current guidance is actually 1.5 meters per second for the flexible hosing. Um, but there are nuances of that because it would, you know, there's going to be the fluid velocity of the cold plate, and then there's also the fluid velocity of the secondary piping and the row manifold, etc. So that is another clarification that does need to come across. So. Okay, awesome. Thank you all so much. This was a really engaging topic, lots of questions, and it was really, really great. Um, so thank you, everyone. I know we're at the end of our time. I want to respect your time. So uh, if you have other topics like this that you want to bring in, let Burhano and I know. Subscribe to the Cold Plate <laughs> mailing list, and uh, we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.